Good evening. Good evening. Good to see each one that's here tonight. Hope everybody's been having a good week uh, so far. Several have asked me where we were going to be tonight in our books, and they said, you know, we're sorry to have to ask, you know, but we just couldn't remember where we were. And I said, well, it's not your fault. It's been over a month. So <laughs> we've, uh, between, uh, I believe, the last week of June uh, is what started it all, had camp and then speaking engagement and then VBS and then another speaking engagement and so forth. And, and uh, my goal, my intent is to get us finished with the book of Nahum tonight. And I get us through that because then it's going to be two weeks before we get back to it. So uh, hopefully we can get through Nahum tonight and at least be at a good stopping point uh, for the next few weeks. But uh, it's great to be with you tonight and uh, ready to study back in the Minor Prophets again. As we get started tonight, we want to remember uh, Sister Renette Gilreath. Uh, she is uh, scheduled to have a knee revision surgery tomorrow uh, at Grandview. I uh, thought it was going to be later in the afternoon, but I think they've moved it up to being earlier in the morning. And uh, so certainly keep her in your prayers. Also remember Sister Idra Lowry. She had total knee replacement today. The surgery went well. Uh, she was already back at home, and uh, I'm sure she's at home resting tonight. And we certainly pray that all continues to go well with that and her uh, rehab that she'll have as a result of that. Keep Sister Mamie Houghton in your prayers. Uh, she will have shoulder replacement surgery Friday in Northport, and so we want to remember her. And then also uh, Daniel Smith, who has been on our prayer list and our card list, was transferred to Tuscaloosa on Tuesday to begin rehab. Uh, still has a long recovery period, and the family continues to ask for prayers uh, for him. So keep him in your prayers as well. Anyone else that we need to mention tonight as we get started? All right. Yes, sir. Yeah, we. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, you might have seen in the email yesterday, and I know it's updated on the prayer list as well, but certainly keep uh, Renee Varnado uh, in your prayers. Uh, as you know, she's been on our prayer list and had found a, uh, a mass uh, in her brain. They removed that, sent it off, and they went back. Uh, yesterday, she went back yesterday to get the results from that, and uh, they have determined that she has stage three cancer. Uh, or my understanding, still not sure what what kind or 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 what have you, but uh, she's going to be taking some treatments and things going forward. And so certainly, uh, let's keep her and her family in our prayers. All right. Anyone else? All right, if nothing else, let's go ahead and begin with prayer tonight. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for this opportunity to be assembled together uh, with those of like precious faith. Father, we're so thankful to have the health and the ability and the opportunity uh, to be here tonight, especially as we look around the room and we're mindful of so many who are not able to be with us tonight because of afflictions of the health and and uh, so many uh, among our number, several among our number that are still dealing with or are quarantining because of COVID, several others who are preparing for procedures or at home recovering from procedures. And, and uh, Father, we're just uh, so thankful to, to be able to be here, and we pray for all these that are not able to be here with us tonight. We want to especially bring before your throne of grace, Sister Renette Gilreath, be with her as as uh, she's going to have that knee revision surgery tomorrow. We pray that all would go well with it. We pray for Sister Edrill, and we're thankful for uh, the surgery that she had today and, and everything going well with that procedure, and we pray she continue to make a full recovery. We pray for Sister Mamie as she awaits uh, surgery Friday. pray that all will go well with it and continue to be with Daniel Smith as he continues the long road of recovery. And... Uh, uh, continues to do his rehab there in, in Tuscaloosa. And Father, there are many others listed on our prayer list. We want to remember Renee Varnado and her family, especially at this time, and, and uh, all the things that they've been, been going through, Father, with this diagnosis, and now uh, continuing, Father, to, to battle uh, cancer and to be taking these treatments. And we uh, just pray that your hands of care and uh, healing would be upon her 
and between the, the course of treatment that the doctors have established and your uh, loving hands, Father, we pray she might be able to overcome this uh, for her sake and for the sake of her family, Father, and, and just commit all of these things to you. And uh, we trust and, and, and understand, Father, that you are well able to do above all that we could ask or imagine. Father, we uh, also bring before you any who may be dealing with the loss of loved ones. We ask that you would comfort uh, grieving families tonight. May they ever look to you for only for the strength and comfort that only you can provide. Father, we're uh, prayerful for our country and for uh, the state of moral decline uh, that she is in and has been in for some time, Father, and we, we pray that we might uh, be bold and courageous enough to take the gospel message into the world knowing that, uh, that it's the only thing that's truly going to make a difference, Father, and we pray for those in positions of authority and leadership and uh, we pray, Father, that our efforts to further the borders of thy kingdom would not be hindered uh, by those in power. We're thankful, Father, to have this place to meet tonight for the many blessings, physical blessings that you've bestowed upon this congregation of your people. Uh, we're much more fortunate than many others in our own uh, country, and then especially, Father, than in other countries as well. We pray that we would allow the blessings that you've given to us to benefit our ability uh, to spread the gospel. We pray, Father, that you would bless our efforts to evangelize, to be benevolent, and to edify and build up the body of Christ that meets here. And may you receive all the honor and glory for all the things that we're able to accomplish. Continue now, Father, to go with us for the remainder of our service tonight. May all the things that we do here be in accordance with your will. And above all, for which we have to be thankful, we're most thankful for the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ, through whom we have those blessings, this avenue of prayer, and that hope of an eternal home with thee. We pray in all things your will be done. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, tonight we're in Nahum chapter 3. Nahum chapter 3. And uh, we're going to try to get through that text and then uh, answer our questions at the end of this uh, chapter in our workbook. Uh, just to recap with you a little bit about where we've been in the book of Nahum because it's been some time. Remember that the book of Nahum is all about the destruction of Nineveh. Uh, he's writing a few uh, hundred years after Jonah has been sent by God to the city of Nineveh. And you'll remember when Jonah went, the city repented, you know, in sackcloth and ashes. They were penitent for uh, the message that Jonah preached. But now time has passed and they've turned back to their wickedness and uh, probably even surpassed their wickedness from before, according to some of the things that are said about them in Nahum's writing. And so Nahum writes back to them and he's telling them judgment's coming and you're going to be destroyed. And, and Nahum chapter 1 was Nineveh's doom described. Nahum chapter 2 was Nineveh's doom depicted. And there were a lot of things uh, there that God showed them about the coming destruction uh, that was going to be theirs, about how the floodwaters were going to break forth and they were not going to be able to retain things or, or keep, it from, keep God's wrath from flooding over them, so to speak. And so then you get to Nahum chapter 3, and, uh, and you're going to have Nahum, uh, Nineveh's doom defended. In other words, this is going to be kind of the, the conclusion of the whole matter, if you will, where God sort of explains one final time why this is happening, and, uh, and to show that he is just in bringing about this punishment upon the city of Nineveh. Now, remember that the city of Nineveh stands really to represent the entire kingdom of Assyria. Nineveh was the chief city. Uh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, the Assyrian Kingdom, and they're going to be replaced on the world stage uh, ultimately by the Babylonians. Now history tells us that Assyria was taken down by a collection of people primarily led by the Babylonians and the Medes. But the Babylonians are the ones who are ultimately going to take their spot, take their place on the world stage, if you will, as the next world power. And uh, that's what all of this is pointing to. So you come to, to Nineveh, uh, Nineveh, Nahum chapter 3, and uh, verse 1, you have the condemnation pronounced. It's pronounced as a woe. And, of course, anytime God pronounces woes against someone, uh, it's going to be a, a terrible thing. You'll remember even Jesus pronounced woes against certain cities that did not repent at the preaching of the gospel and the performing of uh, the signs, wonders, and miracles by uh, the disciples of Christ. And that's how verse 1 begins here. He says, Woe to the bloody city 
It is full of lies and robbery, and the prey departeth not. Uh, the reason stated for the woe here is threefold in verse 1. First, he says, because you're a bloody city. Now, uh, what I'm going to read to you is, uh, is maybe uh, a little bit gruesome, but I think it encapsulates uh, why it is that God called them a bloody city. Now, this is uh, straight out of the pulpit uh, commentary, a statement about why God called them a bloody city, and here's what said. The cruelty of the Assyrians is attested by the monuments, that is, their own monuments, the things that they built to uh, commemorate when they would capture other people. And it says, In which we see or read how prisoners were impaled alive, flayed, beheaded, dragged to death with ropes passed through rings in their lips, blinded by the king's own hand, hung up by hands or feet to die in slow torture. Others have their brains beaten out or their tongues torn out by their roots, while the bleeding heads of the slain are tied around the necks of the living, who are reserved for, for, uh, for further torture. The royal inscriptions recount with exultation the number of the enemy slain and of captives carried away, cities leveled with the ground, plundered and burnt, lands devastated, and fruit trees destroyed, and on and on it goes. <clears throat> now those are not just things that are hearsay. I mean, th these are how they recorded their advancements in their own history. They were a cruel people. And, uh, and they didn't have mercy on anybody. And so when God says, woe to you, that, you know, destruction and judgment is coming because you're a bloody city, that, those are the kind of things that he's referring to. The way they had so wickedly treated other people. The second cause, he says, is because you're full of lies. Uh, history also records for us how the Assyrians were a treacherous people. Uh, they oftentimes made promises that they had no intentions of keeping. Uh, to try to get someone to partner with them or to let down their defenses, they would promise all sorts of things, never having any intention whatsoever of delivering on those promises. We can find one example of that uh, in the book of Isaiah. Turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 36. You remember that uh, Assyria sends out some... Uh, Representatives, one of which uh, goes by the name of Rob Shakar, and uh, and he's appealing to Hezekiah's people, and he's trying to tell them, listen, uh, Hezekiah's going to tell you that that uh, that y'all need to fight and to stand firm, and he's telling them, you don't listen to Hezekiah, but I want you to pay attention to how he does it. Uh, Isaiah 36, and uh, beginning at verse 13, it says, then Rob Shakar stood. He's the representative from Assyria stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. In verse 16, it says, Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria. Now, here's the promise. Make an agreement with me by a present, a tribute, and come out to me, and eat ye every one of his vine and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one of the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away into a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. You see the promise there? They said, listen, this is what the king of Assyria is promising. Just pay a tribute and you can stay right there at home for a little while. Drink, you know, eat your own fruit, drink from your own sisters. Nobody's going to take you out of your house and drag you off into a foreign... You, you can stay there for a little while. And then when we do take you to another land... Uh, verse 17, you know, until I come to take you away, we are eventually going to take you. But, you know, you'll be fine until then. And then even when we do come and take you away, we're just going to put you in a place that's just like home. You, you won't even be able to tell the difference between the place where we're moving you to the place where we're, where we're going to put you. 
Do you know what Assyria really had in mind for them? Just go back and see what they did to Israel. And you'll see what they really had in mind. Complete destruction. What was left of the city of Samaria after Assyria got through with it? Not much. Not much. And they took everybody else and either killed them with the sword or sent them off to be slaves somewhere else in some other part of the kingdom. God here says through Nahum, the reason you're going to be destroyed is because you're full of lies. They were a treacherous people who lied to others to get them to let down their defenses. And then when they did, they took advantage of them. They were a bloody city, full of lies. And then he says, number three, full of robbery. The word that is here translated robbery means literally to rend in pieces. And that makes a little bit more sense when you consider the end of the verse where it says, and the prey departeth not. Uh, you are a people who tear into pieces everything that you have your chance to get, the hand, get, get your hands on and the prey is not able to escape. The prey departeth not. And so they were a people without mercy. Uh, the woe upon Nineveh, if you summarize these three things, is because of her bloodshed, her deceit, and her violence. Bloodshed, deceit, and violence. And you can take those three things and, and apply them to almost any world power or kingdom that has ever been, and those three things have contributed to its downfall. Bloodshed, deceit, and violence. Does it sound like a society we know? I don't think you have to go that far, but it does. Yeah. Uh, you know, sounds like, uh, Brother Chuck said Russia, and I would agree, sounds like United States in some ways. Sounds like a lot of other... You know, and, and again, you know, we've, we've seen this reoccurring theme throughout the Minor Prophets reminding us of what the Bible teaches us that sin is a reproach to any people. God used the, God raised up the Assyrians to accomplish His judgment upon His own people. But their wickedness grew so great that He couldn't look the other way any longer. And that's a reoccurring theme uh, throughout the book of Nahum and the Minor Prophets as well is God is long-suffering but His patience has... It's breaking point. And Nineveh had found that breaking point. Any questions or comments before we move on? All right. Uh, in verses 2 and 3, you begin to have some of the sights and sounds of the judgment being mentioned. In fact, I, in verse 2, I would say you have the sounds of the judgment. In verse 3, you have the sights of judgment based on the, the way he describes these two things. And so because of who they are, God says, The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. Verse 2 is all about the noise. You know, when God's judgment comes to Nineveh, they're going to hear a lot of the same noises that they've caused their enemies to hear. The sound of the whip, the noise of the wheels on the chariots rattling, uh, the sound of the horses and the chariots jumping. Uh, God's judgment is approaching. And those sounds are going to echo throughout Nineveh. Verse 3, the, the focus, the, the sense, I guess you should say, uh, or I should say, changes a little bit from the sound to the sight. Notice how he describes some of these visual things in verse 3. The horseman lifteth, lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. You, you get the image of an army that's on their way and you can hear them first. You know, you can hear the rumbling of the chariots. And then as they begin to come into view, you can see the swords and the spears glistening in the sun. It says, uh, there is a multitude of slain, a great number of carcasses. You see that visual image of bodies lying in the streets. And he says, and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. And so that's the sounds and the sights of the judgment. These awful sights Nineveh had caused others to see and to hear time and time again. But now they're going to hear the sounds. And they're going to see the sights. 
God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians chapter 6. And Nineveh had sown some terrible seeds. And it was time for them to reap. In verses 4 through 10, you have the certainty of what's to come. It says in verse 4, Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile and will set thee as a gazing stock. It shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Whence shall I seek comforters for thee? Art thou better than populous? No. That was situate among the rivers, that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea, and her wall was from the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lubum were, there, were thy helpers, yet was she carried away, she went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets, and they cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. In verse 4, you have the certainty of their wickedness. Uh, long story short, he says Assyria had played the harlot. Uh, the workbook says, uh, I kind of like the way the writer of the workbook put it, he said that Assyria was going to be punished because of her harlotries and her sorceries. And uh, that's a good you know, summary of, of verse 4 there. They had played the harlot like a well-favored uh, woman uh, lures a man to his destruction, so Assyria had done to others, bringing them to their downfall, selling nations by her whoredoms. Second to that, he mentions her sorceries, her witchcraft being part of the uh, occult, if you will, and uh, through which she had plundered families. Uh, some biblical scholars believe that what uh, Nineveh was really known for, I guess based on some historical references and some other things as it pertains to their witchcraft, was a form of necromancy, trying to communicate with the dead. And it seems from what God says about them here that through that means they had taken advantage of families. You know, now to what extent, I, I don't know, but you know, we've seen in some of the other minor prophets already that God really has a disdain for taking advantage of people. You know, to go back to Amos and what were they doing? They were making themselves rich by taking from the poor and, uh, you know, changing the balances and all of these kind of things to take advantage of those who were, who were already in need and they were doing it to take even more. And so perhaps some of that's coming through again here where they were using some of these things to take advantage of the weak among them or the suffering among them. In verses 5 through 7, you, you have the certainty of her shame. And verses 5 and 6 says God's going to put her to shame. He says, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, basically pull your skirt over your head. Basically what he says in verse 5. Well, you think about how embarrassing that would be. Think about uh, how much shame that would bring, or maybe I say should bring. There may be some that wouldn't blush at that in our society today, but you think about the shame that it should bring. And that's what God's saying. He's, I'm going to uncover you for everybody to see. I'm going to embarrass you because that's what you've done to others. He says uh, he's going to make them a gazing stock. Uh, I always think about, uh, I guess, you know, you always see in like medieval movies or times, you know, where the, the, the criminal or whoever it's found is put in the gazing stock there in the center of town. You know, they're locked into that thing and, and the crowd's there to throw things at them and, and uh, to beat them or to make fun of them, whatever is part of their punishment. And uh, that's sort of the visual image you get from what God says here. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw abominable filth upon you and make you vile and I'm going to set you up as a gazing stock for everyone to pass by and revile you. I think maybe the saddest question and all of the book of Nahum is asked in verse 7 when God says, the people will see you and they'll say, Nineveh is laid waste. And here's the question, who will mourn you? Who's going to mourn Nineveh? 
And it's a rhetorical question because the answer is nobody. They had been so cruel and had so mistreated everybody else that when the people around them heard about the downfall of Nineveh, nobody would mourn. Can you imagine receiving news that an entire nation of people, and, and even if we just let's, just, let's just hold this to the city of Nineveh. How many inhabitants were in the city of Nineveh? Close to a million by some conservative standards. And you receive news that that many people have been laid to waste and there's no mourning. How did we feel? How did we feel turning on our televisions? And uh, since Brother Chuck mentioned Russia a moment ago, how did we feel when we turn on our televisions and you see the things going on in Ukraine? And you see mothers and children and you know trying to escape the country and doing everything they can to get out of harm's way and they're fleeing for their lives and and uh, you know and rightfully so we pray for them and we shed tears over it and we you know we we send money and we send supplies and we try to find some way to co connect with somebody over there to see you know what way we can help and and all of that's good all of that's right but now I, I just want you to try to imagine hearing news that that kind of thing has taken place and nobody mourns if that doesn't help us to understand how wicked this, these people had become and how they had so mistreated others God says you're going to be destroyed and nobody's going to care who's going to mourn you and who's going to comfort you it's a rhetorical question and the answers are nobody verses 8 through 10 then you come to the certainty of her demise and God asked the question, is Nineveh greater than the populace No, King James Version says the populace No. Uh, ASV says No Ammon. Uh, that's another name for the city of Thebes, which was the capital of Egypt. And uh, he goes on to describe how she was situated among the rivers and so forth. The city of Thebes sat at the head of the Nile and uh, used a portion of the Nile to surround the city and really give it a great advantage if someone wanted to try to come and take the city of Thebes, they not only had to deal with the walls of the city and the army, but they also had to contend with the Nile and, uh, and, and all of these other things. And so, you know, God points that out and he says, are you any better than them? Now, what's interesting is, and uh, this is just be a little bit of pop quiz if there's any history buffs in here, but who took the city of Thebes? I'll give you one guess. Somebody say, no. Who did? I'm sorry. Yeah, Alexander would take it later. Yeah. Right. Assyria. They're the ones who took the city. The reference that God is making about are you any greater, are you any different, are you any better than the city of Thebes is, is actually recalling a portion of their own history where they took the city of Thebes, you know. And, and Egypt at the time when Assyria took it, he talks about her having all of the strength of Egypt and Ethiopia. When the city of Thebes was taken by Assyria, it was at its peak. It had the whole nation of Egypt there to support it. It had Ethiopia in its pocket to, to provide some help. Uh, commentators and scholars go back and forth about whether Put and Lubum were helps to Assyria or helps to Egypt. And everybody's a little bit unclear on that. But I think uh, what's to be uh, really mentioned is he says uh, that their military strength and their help from Egypt and the other, he says it was infinite. If anyone had looked at the city of Thebes and thought we could take it, God said that, you know, that's, that was not a common thought. But who took it? Assyria did. And now God's telling them the way that you took Thebes it's the same way that you're going to be taken now. I don't really want to get into the visual imagery 
that's given here by Nahum about what they did when they took the city of Thebes. But he says she was carried away, went into captivity, and that, of course, that has Assyria written all over it. They're the ones that kind of, kind of really started that. And he says her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets. They murdered the children and took the men, bound them in chains, and took bids for them. Again, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God says, are you any better? Are you any different than Thebes, than Noammon? And the answer is no. In fact, there are many similarities between the two. Uh, Nineveh, the city of Thebes, was situated upon the Nile. And the city of Nineveh is situated upon the Tigris, another great river of the ancient world. The city of Thebes had great walls. The city of Nineveh had perhaps some of the greatest walls that the world had ever known to that point. You remember when we talked about Nineveh uh, for the book of Jonah, we talked about how some scholars estimate that three chariots could have rode across the top of the wall uh, uh, that went around the city of Nineveh, uh, you know, three, three chariots wide. The city of Thebes had help. They had nations around them that could support them militarily. So does Assyria. And at the end of the day, it's going to mean just as much for Assyria as it did for Thebes. In a, in a sense, God is showing them, it doesn't matter what you do. Judgment's coming and there's no escaping it. Just like there was no escape for the city of Thebes. It might even be the case, as some suggest, that God is even saying in the same way that they showed the city of Thebes no mercy, that God will show no mercy for them. Any questions or comments about uh, those verses, verses 4 through 10? Yes, sir. Right. Right. And that's what and and Right. And that's what we've got to keep emphasizing, you know. That that's why I asked the question, you know, does that sound like a society today? Because, you know, if we're not careful we get we get sort of disconnected from it and we say, Oh, well that's what happened to Nineveh and that's how God dealt with them and when what we what we need to be realizing is that's how God will deal with this nation or any other nation. It's how he's dealt with every kingdom that's ever been. And, uh, and so, you know, certainly you have that universal principle, and we need to remember that for sure. All right, in, in verses 11 through 19, then you have the conclusion, if you will, uh, of what's going to take place. And uh, in verse 11, he says, Thou also shall be drunken, and, and that sort of harkens back to chapter 1 and verse 10. You remember God said he would take them when they were drunken, History confirms for us that the king of Assyria had uh, thrown together uh, or had called for a drunken feast uh, to be had and they were in the middle of that drunken feast whenever they were invaded. And, uh, and so God says, Thou shalt also be drunken. He says, Thou shalt be hid. Thou shalt seek strength because of the enemy. You know, you, you might think that you're hidden or you might think that you're able to stand strong, but you're not. Verse 12, he says, they're ripe for the taking. He says, all thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. God gives him a picture of a man walking up to a fig tree that's ripe, the fruit's ripe, and he just shakes the tree with his mouth open and the fruit just falls off in his mouth. And God says, that's what it's going to be like for you. You're not going to be any stronger. You're not going to have any more of an ability to protect yourself than the fig tree has a chance of keeping the fruit from falling off of its limbs. You're ripe for the taking. He says uh, your strength's going to be uh, taken. Verse 13, the, the people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open upon thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Uh, things that had been a strength for Nineveh will seem as though they're a weakness. Think about how much trust they had put into their military might. And now God says, the people in the midst of thee are women. Now, I, uh, obviously, I don't mean that in a, in a 
and a sexist or derogatory you know, uh, thing. But if you think about the world at that time, uh, you know, women didn't serve in you know, the military it, during this time in the world. And, uh, and women, they had their place in society. And so to tell an army of men that they were as women is meant as a slight to the, to the army of the Assyrians. You're not going to be strong enough. You're not going to be able uh, to defend yourselves. Your gates, uh, verse 13, your gates is going to be like they're standing wide open. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies, and the fire shall devour thy bars. There may have been no more important physical feature of a city wall than the gate. And uh, so oftentimes a city's uh, ability to withstand a siege rested solely on that point. And God says, your gates might as well be wide open because I'm going to crash right through them. Verse 14 and 15, he says, Do your best to make everything stronger to get ready, but it will be to no avail. Draw thee waters for the siege. Fortify your strongholds. Go into clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the brickland. In other words, reinforce your walls. The fire is going to devour thee. The sword will cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm. Make thyself many as the locust. Multiply as many people to your army as you want to. It's not going to help. Verses 16 through 19, he makes it clear that no man can save you. Their merchants... Verse 16, he says, Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. These merchants had brought Assyria great wealth. And God says, All oh, that's not going to help you at all now. Uh, verse 17, uh, their uh, shepherds or their, uh, I'm sorry, ver, uh, verse 17 is uh, the crowned and the nobles, the captains. Uh, in other words, uh, some of the military leaders that had surely brought many great victories to Assyria. Uh, he says, you know, they're like the locusts and, and they're great, great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away and their place is not known where they are. They're not going to be any help. They're going to be like those locusts that when they get cold, they get stuck and they hide and wait for the sun to rise. And as soon as the sun rises and their bodies are warmed and they're able to move their wings again, they fly away. And that's what your strong men are going to be like. In verse 18, he references their shepherds, that is, their rulers, their nobles, their, their counselors. And uh, notice what he says about them in verse 18. He says, Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Syria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. What do you think that means? They're dead. Leaders are gone. If you were to summarize these three points, what God is saying is your wealth isn't going to save you. Your military strength isn't going to save you. And it doesn't matter who you have in a position of authority, they're not going to save you. Because God's judgment is coming. And then in verse 19, he says, There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous, and all that hear the bruit of thee shall clap the hands over thee. I mentioned a moment ago that God asked who will mourn. Well, now he shows us that not only is nobody going to mourn, but they're actually going to rejoice. And he says, for upon whom, and this is the reason why, for upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually. And that's the last line of Nahum's writing. Nineveh's wickedness had touched everybody that they had ever come into contact with. And now they pay the price. I don't believe that our nation is to that point yet. But if something doesn't change, it might only be a matter of time. If we can't learn from what's already taken place, history is bound to repeat itself. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our what? Learning. So that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Paul said in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, these things were written for our admonition and for our example. 
Need to remember that. All right, any questions or comments before we look at some lessons to learn real quick? Man, there's the bell. All right, real quick, lessons to learn from Nahum chapter uh, 3. Uh, woe for bloodshed, deceit, and violence. We've got to remember that God does not tolerate those three things for very long. Number two, you think about the sights and sounds of judgment. We're given that as a depiction of Nineveh, but the New Testament gives us a good bit of the sights and sounds of the great day of judgment. And we would be wise to remember those as well. Keep in mind that sin leads to shame always. If not in this life, certainly in the one to come. Number four, man cannot stand against the judgment of God. It doesn't matter who you are or what you turn to. The wealth and the might of man's wisdom cannot save. And then I think maybe the greatest question uh, that we could maybe ask from Nahum chapter 3 is, what will my end be? Now, I, I, don't, I don't mean to say that I hope everybody weeps and cries, you know, when I'm gone. And, you know, in fact, uh, I hope I've continued to live in such a way that when my life here is over, folks know that I, I've just gone home. You know, like, like Paul waiting for his ship to carry him home. That's, that's what I want the end of my life to be like. But if we've lived in such a way that the question even asked to be asked, who will mourn? What will my end be? How have I dealt with people through the course of this life? And have I so treated someone that they might actually find joy in my downfall? I hope that that couldn't be said of any of us. But I think that's a question we have to ask after looking at Nahum chapter 3. Well, we didn't get to the questions like I wanted to, and we're out of time. But uh, we'll get back in a couple of weeks uh, to that. And we'll answer those questions and then move on uh, through the minor prophets. Any questions or comments or anything anybody would like to add? Well, that's, going, that's coming later because he's Babylon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he obviously didn't learn from them. Right. Any other comments, questions? All right, if not, thank you for your time and, and for your attention tonight.
Who's got opening? Good evening. Time for us to go ahead and get started tonight. Have just a few announcements uh, to get through. Certainly good to see everyone here tonight. We want to remember in our prayers, uh, Sister Renette Gilreath, uh, she's going to have knee revision surgery tomorrow at Grandview, and uh, hopefully uh, everything will go well with it, and we pray that she's able to make a, a full recovery and, and get to a much better portion of her health. Sister Idra Lowry had total knee replacement today, and that surgery went well. She's at home recovering from that, and I'm very thankful uh, for that good news. Sister Mamie Houghton is going to have shoulder replacement surgery Friday in Northport, so let's keep Sister Mamie in our prayers. Also, I uh, continue to remember Daniel Smith. Uh, he's been on our prayer list and our card list. Uh, he was transferred to Tuscaloosa on Tuesday to begin rehab. And uh, he still has a long recovery period, and the family continues to ask for prayers for him. We also want to continue to remember Renee Varnado. Many of you perhaps have already seen on either social media or through the email yesterday uh, that the uh, biopsy and things they'd sent off had come back yesterday and showed that she has stage 3 uh, cancer. Uh, not sure of all the details of that, but she will be taking some courses of treatment. Uh, for several weeks, and so certainly let's keep uh, Renee Varnado and her family in our prayers. As far as announcements go, uh, the bus is going to go to Northport Friday night for their singing. Uh, departure time will be 5.50, and if you have any further questions about that, you can see Brother Chuck for any other details uh, concerning that. Also, uh, the Riverbend uh, Congregation, Riverbend Church of Christ in Dalton, Georgia, where uh, Barry Grider preaches. Chuck was just asking me if I had anything on this, and I was saying, no, I've not got anything that's right here on my announcement sheet. Uh, but uh, that just shows you who really knows what's going on around here, and that's, you know, Sister Dana. So, uh, right, right. Uh, but the Riverbend Congregation in Dalton, Georgia, where Brother Barry Grider preaches, they're hosting a Young at Heart for Senior Saints uh, seminar on August the 9th with Brother Jeff Jenkins uh, speaking there. Uh, Chuck is wanting to take the bus. If there are, are enough that are wanting to go, uh, if there will be enough participation for this trip. And so if you would be interested in going on that trip, uh, get with Brother Chuck and let him know uh, so that they can plan accordingly for that. Also keep in mind that this coming Sunday will be our fifth Sunday services, which means we'll meet at our normal time for Sunday morning uh, Bible class and worship, and then uh, we'll have a fellowship meal provided, and then we'll uh, come back in here for the song service that will begin at 1 o'clock. Uh, Brother Carson Nichols is going to be preaching uh, Sunday morning. Uh, don't look surprised. You already knew that. And, uh, and then... Uh, uh, and then Kurt, man, I, I just wanted to call you Chuck for like two minutes there, and I don't know why. I guess because I was just talking to Chuck. Uh, and then Brother Kurt Porter is going to have the devotional for uh, the song service for us. I mentioned in our Bible class, it'll be a few weeks before I get back in here. Uh, that's because uh, we're taking a little vacation time, and then I've got a few uh, speaking engagements. So uh, this coming Sunday, you'll have Carson and Kurt. And then Wednesday night, a week from tonight, Brother Josh Taylor will be teaching this class. Uh, that following Sunday, Brother Bobby Liddell will be here to teach Bible class that morning and preach that morning. And then Brother Joey Treat will be here uh, to update us on his mission work that Sunday night. And then that following Wednesday night, Brother Owen Sweat's going to teach or make sure something is ready to go uh, for the, the adult class that following Wednesday night. So uh, you won't see me for a few services, but we'll be anxious to get back here with you. And uh, I know that uh, certainly everything's being left in good hands. Are there any other announcements or anything that I may have overlooked? Yes. Right. Uh, certainly uh, great to see Sister Betty back uh, tonight, and Brother David as well. Uh, as you know, several from among our number have been uh, dealing with COVID, and, and while the symptoms haven't been uh, just terrible, have had to stay away or stay at home and, and go through all the the process of quarantine and everything, and it's so good to have those back that have not been able to be with us for the last few weeks. Anyone else or anything else that I may have overlooked? 
All right, what's that song again? 380. 380, number 380 is going to be our song of encouragement in just a few moments. And you'll need your books. Uh, PowerPoint's still down, uh, and uh, we're just uh, waiting on the replacement part to come in for that, and, uh, and that'll be back up and running soon. Have you ever come across an account of a very familiar Bible study but then something jumps out to you that you had never really considered before from that text. I, I guess we've all probably been there, and God's Word is just that way sometimes. You know, you, you can uh, just keep uh, reading and reading and studying and studying and find something new uh, all the time. I think about uh, Brother Gus Nichols used to say that trying to uh, take in all that the Bible has to offer is like trying to drink the ocean with a spoon. And, uh, you know, you just keep dipping and dipping and dipping. I was looking over Genesis chapter 6, which is a chapter of the Bible that we've known from the time that we were children. The thoughts of every man's heart was evil only continually. But Noah found grace in the eyes of God, and God gives Noah the instructions to build the ark. We're all familiar with the account, and we even memorize you know, certain numbers. How many days did it rain, and how, you know, how many days was Noah and his family in the ark, and so forth. But there was something that jumped out to me in, in looking over this that I don't know that I had ever considered, maybe to the degree that I should have, but it really just jumped out to me this time. In, in Genesis 7 and verse 16, after the flood has begun and, and Noah and his family have entered into the ark, uh, the animals have entered into the ark, and in verse, verse 16 of Genesis 7 it says, And they that went in went in male and female of flesh as God had commanded him. And, and here's the part that jumped out to me. And the Lord shut him in. And so Noah has, has built the ark. He's been preaching the whole time. Uh, he's able to save his family. Eight souls enter into the ark. The animals enter into the ark. Noah has done all that God has commanded him to do. And then the text says, And then God shut the door. The Lord shut them in. And I couldn't help but think about when you put it into those terms, the Lord shut them in. God closed the door. Then I couldn't help but think about Matthew 25 and those five foolish young women who didn't have enough oil to be prepared and they ran to those that sold and they, they tried to buy some oil and they get there, but by the time they get back, the bridegroom who's a representation of Christ, has already gone into the reception with his bride, which is the church, and the door was shut. And as much as those five foolish would beat on the door and cry out and say, let us in, the bridegroom said, I don't know you. And I think about in, in Noah's day, when God shut the door to the ark, that was it. Once the door was shut, everybody who was outside of the ark was going to remain outside of the ark. And everybody who was inside the ark was going to remain inside the ark. And God had shut the door. And, and Noah, if he, was, if he was a preacher of righteousness like Peter said that he was, for the, for the duration of the time that the ark was being built, he must have had a heart that cared for people that wanted all the people around him to be saved. And, and I just can't help but think about how torn Noah must have been when the floodwaters began to break forth and the rains began to fall and how many people must have ran to the ark trying to get in, but God had shut the door. And it just, it's just another one of those reminders to us that there comes a time when it's too late. When the door has been shut and there's no way to get in. And everybody who's outside of the saving vessel will remain outside of the saving vessel. That was the case with the ark. That was the case with the parable of the five, uh, or the, the, the five wise and the five foolish young women. And that'll be the case with the church when the Lord comes again. We don't know when that time will be or when our life here might be over. But I know that we've got right now. And right now, the door's open. 
right now the door into the saving vessel is open. The only question that remains is, are we going to walk through it before it's too late? If you've not walked through that door because you've never obeyed the gospel, then won't you make that decision tonight? We'll assist you in every way that we can to put on Christ in baptism, having faith and, and repenting of your sins and confessing Jesus. And we'll baptize you tonight and you'll be added into the saving vessel, the church. Maybe it's the case that you were, you were once in the saving vessel, but because of sin and choices in life, you've now find yourself back outside. Won't you come back home? Won't you come back in and make things right before it's too late? I don't know what tomorrow holds in store. You don't know what tomorrow has in store. But the door is open right now. How sad would it be for this to have been the last opportunity and for us to get to that day of judgment and to find out that God has shut the door. If you need to respond tonight, won't you come? While together we stand and sing. will bow with me please our holy God in heaven we come before your wonderful throne of grace tonight thanking you for the opportunity that you've given us to come out to this place in the middle of the week we thank you for the teachers that were here tonight that taught the, the younger classes we thank you for Caleb and his ability to teach this class in the auditorium we know that we have many of our number and of the community that are sick have been going through procedures or are going to go through procedures. We ask that you be with them, be with the doctors, the nurses, and the family members that will be taking care of them and let them do the things that are needed to give them back a rightful portion of their health. As we're about to depart from this place, Father, we ask that you go with us, guide us, guard us, and direct us and keep us ever in the hollow of thy hand. In Christ I pray, amen.